us, uh, so I won't uh, take any names, but uh, all the presentations have been very nice, I think, and we have uh, gained a lot from them. I hope we'll be getting a copy of uh, the presentation, hopefully. Uh, coming to my uh, question, uh, before that, let me give my introduction. I am uh, Kalpana Mathur from uh, Educational Multimedia Research Center at JNV University at Jodhpur in Rajasthan. This is uh, the other uh, north uh, part of, uh, close to the desert in this country. And uh, talking of partnerships, uh, well, I'm here because uh, I completed uh, a course which was uh, in partnership with Nixi and Diplo Foundation. We did it online for two and a half months and uh, completed it on 15th November. And that's how I happened to be here at IGF. And coming to this uh, query that I have, uh, or some kind of uh, clarification or some knowledge from all the speakers here, you have said just now, based on the study, that uh, when we talk of the thematic uh, concepts, 95% of the time we are talking of e-government. And I think that's taking off in a big way even uh, in India, and the national e-governance plan is already in place. And also the state uh, mission teams are getting uh, operational. But in my opinion, uh, when we talk of uh, ICT strategies and uh, technology sophistication, what we need to look at is uh, what you have already mentioned is the change management part of it, which has become very, very important, which I think the other uh, speaker, Priyanti, also just said, that how to bring about that, you know, in as far as administration is concerned. So all of us are also looking at that, and I feel that change management becomes a major issue and a very important and significant part of any project of ICT which has to take off, and not only take off, it, if it has to sustain in the, in the long term. So uh, I would like the speakers here, if anybody could tell me what kind of uh, approach or what kind of process or what kind of toolkit could you suggest, particularly for change management as far as e-government is concerned? Thank you. Okay. I, my career has been implementing large um, ICT initiatives. And, um, and I can't agree with you more. I think the issues that we have, I mean, the technology is the easy part. I mean, anybody can configure um, a server and implement it. But to get the people to change um, is so difficult, especially um, when they're comfortable in what they're doing. And what I can do is give you an example of what we did in Ontario. And uh, we went through a significant re-engineering exercise of which uh, potentially jobs can be lost. And um, what, we, what, what I did in that instance is to have a very good sponsor. The sponsor was the Minister of Finance. And when you're looking at change initiatives, it's very important that you select the right sponsor, the sponsor that has the influence and has the ability to put resources into a project. But what was more important than the sponsor was the signal and the message that he sent to the staff. And he said quite clearly and unequivocally, that no one will lose their jobs. And I think that's a key message in terms of how we successfully implemented that change initiative within the Ministry of Finance. And um, so based on the experience that I have, right, um, there are a variety of change, um, change management workshops that I've delivered and will be delivering in the various regions because one of the components in re-engineering and national ICT strategies would be change management. And I have two components, right, in each one of these workshops dedicated solely to change management. But again, right, I mean, based on my experience, you need to have the right sponsor. You need to ensure that uh, in any change management initiative, right, the employees, their, their concerns and their fears are addressed. And you also have to ensure that your vision is very clear. What is it you're trying to achieve and the benefits associated with that, with that change initiative to each stakeholder? Right, that must be conveyed very clearly. Right, so um, so if if you, I think you're in a, one of the Commonwealth countries, so please keep an eye out and you're on my website. That will give you some clues in terms of the various workshops we will be delivering in the various regions. And of course, change management is going to be quite important to national ICT strategies and also for re-engineering uh, workshops that we'll be delivering. Thanks very much. People, uh, when we do a training, is the first step is a political will. 
without a political will and a sponsors that can really assess the process, we cannot do anything. I mean, you can train people, but you cannot do, uh, you cannot produce the, the, the effect at the end. Uh, and one of the, the um, steps that you have to do after the, any trainings uh, is to get people involved. Because if you train them and you don't get them involved, you did nothing. And again, it ends up on, on a higher level of political will uh, and maybe even the understanding of, of those that are in power, the, the, the uh, highest officials, as Tony said, that they, they should understand that there is no need that someone loses a job because of that, that it, this, these changes can effectively help everyone and, and the whole system and even them, the politicians and those folks that are in power, just to put it that way. Thanks. I'm Vijay Aditya. I'm the control of Certifying Authorities, Government of India. And the, I'm referred to the questions laid by the lady. I just give, wants to give some information. Uh, the Government of India has implemented an act, which is called the IT Act 2000, where the digital signature is equivalent to the handwritten signature. We have uh, several projects where this digital signature is made compulsory by the corresponding application providers. For example, in the Ministry of Commerce, which we have to register a company, you have to use the digital signature. Similarly, if you are doing to try to do the e-procurement, you have to use the digital signatures. In the judiciary sector, we have the judgments given by the honorable judges is digitally signed and put on the website. So you give it the validity and the legal, what is called legal validity of the particular statements which are put on the system which is provide authenticity of the information that is provided on the site, and also the non-repudiity, which is provided only by the digital signatures. But as I said, there are a lot of awareness needs to be created because people find it inconvenient, if I may use the word, to use the digital signatures in a crypto tokens. That's basically the issue which you know, looked at. Thank you. You can ensure that the evidence you're presenting, whether it's evidence in terms of a contract or evidence in terms of a court of law, I think a signature is extremely important. And, um, and I think with the addition of uh, Mr. Karnik, who's from India, I think um, I'm sure he's quite aware of some of the initiatives that you're, you're actually implementing or, or in the process of implementing in India. And um, I'm sure we can take these experiences from him and, uh, and use that across the come along. Thanks very much for your comment. <coughs> Thank you, Tony. Tom, you wanted to come on it? Tools or techniques. And uh, in the UK, uh, we found that um, the lean service technique, uh, L-E-A-N, lean, um, which falls out of um, kind of quality management and uh, Six Sigma, uh, has been very helpful because uh, we found that the the key is not only to making the services electronic, but to improving the processes. Uh, and so getting the uh, public officials, in particular the staff involved, in making the processes more lean uh, and taking out unnecessary steps has been a really powerful tool and technique for change management uh, because the the managers and the staff uh, re-engineer the processes for themselves to make them faster, leaner, quicker, cheaper, easier. So we found that to be a, a very, very powerful um, change management tool that's worked quite successfully in the UK. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm part of the Diplo program along with Nixie uh, on capacity building for India on inter internet governance. Um, also, I am a project rollout uh, director for uh, ICT initiative of the government on uh, providing rural health insurance for below poverty line people or using smart cards. Um, but our experience has been something like this. Um, there is political will with the people, but uh, suddenly they have an awareness, lack of awareness that we bring much larger things into uh, ICT when we talk about that rather than, you know, they think that we'll bring only 20%, but as we discuss, it's, it's like bringing the entire elephant into the system. And suddenly, you know, there is a trickle-down effect. Like, people are ambitious when they put a roadmap, but during implementations, you don't find that uh, happening as ambitious as it was. What's your experience on that? 
with implementations. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree. Um, the, the important thing is that that um, um, in different in different uh, let's put it this way in different part of, of the world, you have uh, completely different experiences and different um, uh, key topics that are of interest for, for people. Uh, so um, the, the example of, of my country in, in Serbia is when I'm coming back a bit to, to a previous question, but it's related uh, on uh, di digital signature. Uh, is the same thing that this can be the, one of the initiatives that can probably push forward as a, as a quick win, as, as Tony would, would put. Uh, and, uh, but it's, it's uh, this kind of a space is quite a good one to exchange all the experiences and, and probably to link with each other to see which are the good uh, initiatives that we can use and best practices that we can use uh, among each other, right? Probably what I can add very quickly, thanks Mark, is <clears throat> Scope management is very important, and it, sometimes it's difficult to say no to a minister, right? But as a project management, you have to. And when you embark in these large initiatives, right, you must have a very tight scope, because eventually, if you're the project manager, if you agree to the changes, then you're going to be responsible for them. And when things fail, you're going to be responsible for the failures. So. I earned. I learned uh, because I've I've done saying yes too much. That you must say no, and you must have a good scope document, and you must have a good change management process, right? To ensure that any time there is a change in scope, it's fully documented. The consequences are understood, and uh, the sponsors and the politicians agreed to the consequences, and then it can be incorporated into your project plan. And then you must have a baseline in your project plan, right, to demonstrate, you know, if there are changes to the baseline, what are the reasons for those changes? So scope management, I can't agree with more. It's, it's extremely important. Uh, I have a comment about the, the presentation by the gentleman from the Diplo Foundation. And one of the things I picked from his presentation is uh, the issue of walking the talk. Most of the times, you're actually talking about how to how to implement these things, but I think it's very important that we walk the talk as well, other than just talking the walk. And that's one of the things that the EIGF, the East African IGF Forum, must take into consideration. So our our strategy is twofold. First, we identify the issues, and then we find strategies of addressing those issues uh, through perhaps thematic workshops and uh, you know developing strategies on how to implement them. But also very important is also celebrating achievements, and that's one of the things that the national uh, IGF, the, the UK IGF has done. I think it's important that we realize what's being done on the ground and celebrate it so that we can also encourage people to help us realize the, the IGF for the WCS agenda. Now, on, uh, on the presentation by the gentleman who spoke about national ICT policies, now, I've looked at your statistics or your research findings, and given that 95% of national ICT strategies have e-government as a priority area, from your research, are there efforts to harmonize these national ICT strategies, at least at a, a, at a regional level? I think that would be very interesting, uh, especially given uh, the bodiless nature of the internet when it comes to e-governance. Thank you. Any comments from the panel on that, Tony? Yeah, yeah, and um, but just just a bit of um, Commonwealth Connect um, advertising. Uh, we do have a very good program that uh, we deliver on e-government and e-governance, and that's in Singapore. And Singapore, actually, we work with Singapore as a partner in um, showcasing right uh, the power of e-governance and e-government initiatives. And um, one of the good things about this program is that. Uh, Singapore not only um, has talked the talk, but has actually walked the walk. And um, so when you attend the workshop, they, all, they also provide to you the frameworks they've used, but equally important, they take you to site visits so that you can actually see the implementation of these concepts and strategies in, into reality, right? And they bring with them a significant amount of lessons learned. So. Um, so those of you that are interested in, in knowing a bit more about e-government and seeing how it's implemented in Singapore, uh, we do have a workshop that uh, we'll be delivering in February uh, with the government of Singapore in this area. Thanks very much. Thank you. Always, um, uh, I think a few 
key points that have come out of, uh, of the presentations and, and, the, and the discussions and responses to the questions we've had. Um, the emphasis on, on, on partnerships, I think, was a very key, uh, key element in, throughout the, uh, the presentations. The government policymakers can't just work alone. They have to engage with, with the private sector, with civil society, with the technical e experts, with people who have knowledge on the ground in, in developing the toolkits that, that underpin the national strategies, to, toolkits that are vital for developing capacity building, uh, for developing the skills and, and the training initiatives that uh, Vlada has described on behalf of the, of the Diplo Foundation and, and how, uh, how the Diplo is engaging with the, with the Commonwealth uh, Connects uh, uh, strategy on that particular area in, in particular. I think the other key point that, that's come over is the importance of communicating, not only within one particular project, the, the stakeholders within the project, but also communicating with other projects and with other national and regional initiatives what has, has gone well, the, the successful practical solutions that are, are, are rolling out on the ground and, and learning from experience, what, are, what has maybe not worked so well, what has generated a, a, a turn in, 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 in approach and what has led to you know, successful solutions and then looking ahead and developing and implementing those solutions and managing change. That was a very important question, I thought, about uh, the management of, of change. And I think the Commonwealth, as, uh, as a, um, an association of, of a very diverse range of countries, some have have a lot of experience, some other countries are, are starting to embrace the kind of multi-stakeholder approach um, to addressing some of these issues of, of how to, to apply the digital uh, technologies and, the e and uh, in the hope of, of achieving the kind of economic benefits and access for communities, whether in rural, poor, undeveloped areas or in, indeed in, in urban areas where they have other challenges. So a lot of, I think, key themes there and what the Commonwealth Secretariat is doing, I certainly learned a lot myself today about what the Commonwealth Secretariat is doing, is, is mirrors, I think, a lot of the kind of fundamental approach that the Internet Governance Forum is taking. And I, I also appreciate very much the, the, the intervention from uh, the, the speaker from, from Kenya about how the East, East African IGF is, is bringing together several Commonwealth countries and, and one or two other countries as well in that region who are not Commonwealth members, but bringing together the key, the key stakeholders to look at what's going to work in that particular region and how that region's experience in East Africa may also apply to other parts of Africa and indeed other parts of the, of the developing world. So I, I, I picked out some vague important common threads of approach that's being taken that the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat is developing through the Commonwealth Connects program. And I very much hope that this particular program and the contribution that the Commonwealth can make to the IGF, now that we're halfway through this first five-year period set out in the Tunis Agenda from the World Summit, what, uh, uh, how the IGF process can mature. And, how, and I'm, I'm sure that the potential that the Commonwealth has to offer in developing this model of multi-stakeholder engagement, discussion, sharing of best practice, sharing of solutions that are working at the local level as well as the national and, and regional uh, overviews and approaches that are developing in, in that multilateral fo uh, fora, if you like. Um, so it remains to me to thank the panelists, Tony Ming, and Vladimir Radunovic, and, and Tom Walker to thank them for their presentation. And most of all, I want to thank you for your attendance here and for some very stimulating questions, which I think have, have brought out some of the, the fine detail of what initiatives need to take into account. Thank you also for the technical team for delivering, and I hope those who have been following things on the webcast have, have found this a useful um, forum as well. And uh, we look forward to further engagement and contacting us uh, by email this this session today. I'm sorry we've overrun. We had a late start, but I think we've covered a lot of very important issues 
in, in some very good presentations. So I think I want to ask you to, to join me in expressing my appreciation for the, for the panellists and their presentations. So thank you very much. Okay, as I say, I'll, I'll draw that to a close here, but I think it's just the start, and uh, thank you for coming, and uh, we'll see you, no doubt, during the course of the IGF in the next uh, three to four days. Thank you. As we try to set up um, this only session at the IGF related to youth specifically. My name is Maya Angelkovic. I'm here with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, and I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about the history of youth involvement in the WISIS process and the IGF to date, and then I will uh, introduce um, all of the speakers for the session. Um, as you know, young people are leaders and creators in the information society, and uh, they're responsible for much of the very innovative online content um, and internet services that the IGF debates. Unfortunately, youth also face a number of challenges in doing this work. They um, face a lack of capacity, especially um, in terms of the knowledge of the process. They also have a, by definition, there is a lack of continuity involved as youth mature and move through the, through the demographic. New young people come up who don't have the same experience, so there is a constant need for capacity building. And then there is also, they also face a lack of institutional backing, so they are very often in, involved in youth organizations that are only two or three years old, that are not well known to funders, and so they face a number of um, institutional or bureaucratic challenges when they try to get involved in processes like this one. During the World Summit on the Information Society, which, as you know, was a, a very government-dominated process, uh, youth were, for the most part, in the hallways. Um, and organized through a coalition of organizations that was called the Youth Creating, Youth Creating Digital Opportunities, backed by the International Institute for Sustainable Development, the Global Knowledge Partnership, and Taking It Global. Um, the coalition supported a number of young people between the ages of 16 and 24 in, uh, in their involvement in the WISIS process. And uh, they had three important achievements. One. Um, the Youth Caucus was able to draft a youth paragraph in the Geneva Declaration. They also convinced around a dozen governments to include youth representatives on governmental delegations. And finally, the Youth Caucus organized a number of grassroots-led, country-level WISIS youth campaigns. But as the WISIS process ended, and as those who continue to be interested in uh, internet policy issues transition into this multi-stakeholder format um, that we have in the IGF, we seem to have lost the urgency to reach out to young people who may not know about the discussions going on here. And, and they haven't just shown up. Some of them have been here as part of the Diplo Foundation delegation, but that age bracket between 16 and 24, people who are really on the, on the cutting age, uh, are underrepresented. So one of our challenges today is to uh, find ways to get the word out to youth who are concerned about internet governance and the future of the internet as it relates to the, to the world future generations will inherit. And I think uh, some of our speakers will have excellent ideas uh, to help us involve more young people in the IGF and also um, in uh, shaping the future of the internet itself. So. The way the session has been conceived, it will run in two parts. The first one uh, will have um, three presentations. The Marilia Maciel, who is here, uh, she will talk about youth participation, and she is from the Diplo Foundation. Then we'll hear from Idan Katz, who is with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He'll talk to us about digital natives. And uh, then we'll hear from Naveen Tefik from the Egyptian uh, Ministry of Communications and Information Technology, and she's with the Cyber Peace Initiative. And after that, we'll take a short uh, break with a question and answer period, and then we'll have a switch over and going into a second part, and I'll announce those speakers a little bit later. So uh, if you could uh, help me welcome Marilia. Thank you. 
Good morning to all and thank you very much for coming here and participating in this workshop. First of all, I'd like to thank very much Diplo Foundation for the invitation to be here today as a speaker. And I think the most interesting part of the workshops are the debates, so I'm going to try to keep my presentation as brief as possible. What I'm going to talk about here are some difficulties that young people have to be involved in the decision-making process uh, in the IGF decision-making and about some of the possibilities put forth by remote participation to try to minimize this problem, this lack of participation of youth. So, as we know, the IGF was conceived to be a forum as open and as much stakeholder as possible. But this is a goal very difficult to achieve. There are several problems that hinder the a more open participation, and I'm going to talk about some of these problems here. First of all, several people for different reasons cannot attend the IGF. And the people who are not physically present here, they are left apart of the discussions, and they have very little influence over the debates that take place in the IGF. And they have no possibility to interact with their peers and to network. And this is a very important aspect of the IGF, not only to attend the panels, but to be able to find peers with common interest and network, and from there develop common projects together. But some of these groups that cannot attend the IGF are particularly affected by lack of financial resources, and such as people that come from developing countries and youth people. Um, naturally, they don't have established careers, they, don't, they mostly are not part of uh, well-structured organizations, so they lack funds to come to the IGF, and this is a real problem. And we see that there is a contradiction here in a forum that debates the internet one has to be physically present to take part in the process in the decision-making process so to try to tackle this issue some people put together the remote participation working group this group is composed mainly by young people and we have the common concern to foster mechanisms of remote participation in the IGF and the aim is to try to build a bridge among the people who cannot attend the IGF and we that could be present here and make these people be part of the discussions and take part in the debate. To shape this proposal of the remote participation working group, we took some steps. First of all, most of the people are part of Diplo Foundation, but we wanted it to be an, an open group, as open as possible to all interested people. So we put together a list that is open to participation, and we have several uh, meetings, online meetings, to define what's going to happen. And we started to work with two main axes. The first one was to analyze different platforms that could be provided for remote participation. So we analyzed several of them, such as Singularity and Illuminate and Dindim, and Dindim was chosen this year to be the platform for interaction for technical and financial reasons. And the second X of our, our activities was uh, to study the models of remote participation that were being put forth by other meetings, try to see how other meetings were putting forth remote participation. And and we came across a very interesting model that is the model put forth by the AIDS International Conference, which is based on hubs. And so the next step was to try to get in touch with local communities and local groups to organize IGF hubs. And what would be these hubs? These, these hubs are local meetings that exhibit the webcasts of the IGF and also make possible an interaction with people that are present in these local meetings with the people who are present in the IGF. So can, they can send not only text uh, questions and uh, comments, but also live uh, video comments. And uh, it's, uh, we have a name also to build a local community, a community that uh, will be able to discuss the themes that are being debated here in the IGF from a local perspective. And this is a very important aspect of this idea, to get people together locally and start to network and start to develop common projects together. 
So we have several main advantages of the creation of hubs. First of all, it increases the visibility of the IGF locally because the hub organizers are natural publicity for the IGF. They get in touch with civil society and they help to raise awareness of the issues that are being debated here at the IGF. Also, the local media will more likely cover if an event that is taking place locally than one that is taking place overseas. But indirectly, they will also be covering the IGF, so it really helps to increase visibility of the meeting in local places. It helps to raise awareness of IG issues because civil society will know what uh, issues are being tackled here and how it really affects their everyday life. It favors also long-term commitment because if we have only webcasts of the IGF, okay, a person can watch it from home, but once the person is um, tired or had something else to do, he can simply shut down the page and that's it. But if you come together in a hub and you interact with peers, you are more likely to stay until the end of debate and be engaged in a common process, in a community process. So it favors community building and networking, which is a very important part we have here at the IDF, at the IGF. Finding common peers and developing future projects together, and that is the final aim, that these people that come together in hubs locally uh, can take part on future activities that are locally relevant together in the future. So in the end, this process will also benefit the IGF because it will raise the legitimacy of the meeting and will also improve its multi-stakeholder characteristic by empowering individuals, which is, is a segment that cannot really be present and be heard at the IGF if they are, they are not part of any structure organization to come here. So this year, this project has been put uh, into action. It's actually happening now. We have put together seven hubs in uh, different countries, and these hubs are connected right now to the IGF, not only with the main sessions, but also with the workshops. So we are being watched right now, and uh, I thank uh, our hub organizers who, have, who had the effort to put this together. And it's very interesting because each of these hubs have developed their own characteristics. They took the project, but they also added local activities and local features, local characteristics. So each of these ones, uh, each of these hubs has their own profile. And together, we are expecting to have 2,000 two people connecting from the hubs. So it's, it's almost like another IGF that is not taking place in here, but it's taking place locally. So I think that it demonstrates that there is a real interest in remote participation. We only We have to open the channels and people will come, to make it public and people will come. To develop this project, I think it's important to highlight, because it's a youth panel, so our experience may be good to other uh, young people that are developing similar projects. Uh, we had to face some main difficulties, but also we have um, some advantages. Some of the main difficulties were, uh, first of all, to get official support, because we are not a um, structured organization, we are ordinary internet e users, and it's really a bottom-up idea a uh, bottom-up project. So uh, at first it was a little bit difficult to get our voices heard and get through the bureaucracy. It's, we also had in mind that IGF, it's a really delicate political context, so we have many different interests that sometimes clash. So we didn't want to, to compete with other projects of remote participation. Since this, from the start, we wanted to be together with other projects and work together with the secretariat. So we also made it very clear. We don't want to discuss it theoretically, and we, don't, we just want to have a very practical approach to remote participation. Um, and other issue is digital divide, which have been questioned um, that this project is not really directed to people who who don't have internet access. Um, this can be true, but there is also the other side, that people that don't have internet access at home, they can also go to hubs and have access to the IGF from the hubs. Of course, there are places that don't have broadband internet access, and we made it possible that these places, that these people could download the files with the, with the webcast and send their, their questions later, but they lose the synchrony with the IGF 
So this is really a problem that we have to tackle in the future. So really remote participation has to be thought and conceived together with channels of digital, digital divide to, to overcome digital divide. Um, some of the main advantages we have, first of all, is that we work together as a community before, so it helped us to get a common dynamics really fast within the group. And the other point that is very important is that we sent a statement to the open consultations, and it really helped us to get through our voices and to, to get some key people that supported this project. So uh, I'd like to congratulate for this, this opportunity that is open and open consultations for people to send statements and to make their ideas more publicized. And of course the interest of the hub organizers. When once we, we put this project together, hub organizers immediately were interested and developed some amazing experiences locally. And, um, and just to end, I'd just like to make a few comments on how this concerns particularly young people. Young people are most of internet users, but as we have said here, they have difficulties to take part in the decision-making process, not only because of financial constraints, but also because many people believe that young people don't have much to add to the discussion because of lack of experience of whatsoever, which is not really true. Um, if they take part in remote participation spaces, they are more likely to have their voices get through the process and be heard. So young people will also bear the decisions that we take here at the IGF, so it's really important that we engage them in the process today, otherwise they will bear the decisions that they didn't help uh, to make. And young people are most of the users of Web 2.0 tools. They have much experience with that. They are interacting together. It's already happening. So they have a huge facility to, to get used to these channels of remote participation. They do it a lot in their everyday life to, to communicate with their peers, so it's not a novelty to them. They are in a very good position to take advantage of remote participation. Um, we had put together this project with specifically with the uh, IGF Hyderabad in mind, but it's been a success uh, so far. So we wanted to go on with the remote participation working group next year, and I just wanted to highlight that there is uh, this is an open group. So we really much appreciate the engagement of other people and the support we can get from you. Um, we will make an evaluation of the hubs after the IGF, and we hope to come back next year not only with the hubs, but also with more novelties about remote participation mechanisms. You can join us in our web page, is here on the screen, or write me directly in my personal mail, it's also here. I really thank you for your attention, and thank you for coming for this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morelia, for that concrete example of youth leadership. Um, I'd just like to ask our speakers, because we have so many good presentations lined up and we'd like to hear from the audience, if you could uh, keep your uh, presentations to five to ten minutes. Um, and that would be much appreciated. And if we have any questions from uh, online participants, uh, it would be great if you, uh, we could just uh, get those as the session goes on. And our next speaker is Irán Katz uh, on Digital Natives. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, uh, and, and I'm very glad to follow that um, very interesting example of just the spontaneity of what youth participation um, is about. Um, and I think some of what I'm going to say actually resonates with, um, with, with, with what was just said in terms of uh, how naturally some of these ideas of openness and of remote participation, of transparency, and of uh, the network um, uh, come to um, come to young people um, and how they engage with the internet and how they engage with decision-making processes. So uh, the topic I'll be talking about is actually um, digital natives and to tackle 
I think some of what um, uh, youth uh, brings to the substantive aspect of what we're talking about in terms of internet governance. And in particular, I think that um, uh, given um, what, what uh, I know I've been seeing on the news, and I imagine many others of you, uh, of, what, of what happened here uh, in, in India, in Mumbai, uh, last week, uh, the, the extent of, of the change and the importance of this moment, um, uh, not just in India, but uh, around the world, uh, is significant. And I think that the perspective of youth um, is a crucial one um, when we are at a crossroads of choosing, uh, in terms of our infrastructure, whether to pursue more uh, traditional and closed uh, systems or open ones, um, I think that uh, that it's important to, um, to 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 engage the the new ideas and to talk to people um, with whom uh, the notions of openness uh, are more um, natural. So what are digital natives? This is a term that actually is, um, has been recently uh, coined uh, by um, uh, Urs Gosser uh, and uh, John Palfrey um, in a book that was recently published, uh, but captures something that uh, has already been true and a lot of people have been talking about, which is people who have grown up with the internet, people who have grown up in the information age, people who have grown up with mobile phones and for whom it's just not at all uh, uh, different um, to be using these technologies. Um, and, and, and what is it about uh, digital natives that is different? Uh, it's not simply the tools uh, that they're using. It's also the way that they engage with the world, um, I would argue. Uh, one of which is the extent to which uh, information and information products are modifiable. Um, they can change. Um, they can be adapted. Um, this is an important aspect of the technology. Uh, the fact that, um, you know, just as was just described in different ways, uh, there's a sense of collaboration, an ability to plug in to many at once in order to create something, uh, a peer production. There's a diversity in multiculturalism that is natural um, to digital natives, um, always communicating and uh, and working with people, uh, not just locally but uh, internationally, and 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 that's just not something that's as uh, as as new or shocking um, to people who have grown up in this uh, in in this context. And in that, um, it's kind of a tricky balance between a globalism and a localism. Um, I've heard some uh, some uh, anthropologists call it globalism or globalism. Um, none of those are terribly catchy in my view, but. Um, uh, I think there's a there's a tension between between being engaged with the world, uh, but also understanding that it's the local context um, that is important. And I think that um, while it's hard to sort of grasp how they come together, I think it's, it's something that comes very naturally um, uh, to people um, who are uh, who, who who fluidly uh, run from their internet life to their uh, online uh, to their to their um, meat space life uh, and so easily. And there's a multifaceted sense of self, and this is partly due to the social networks and uh, and 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 uh, uh, Facebook and many of those others, um, where there's a very um, uh, tangible sense of the way in which one presents themselves and how uh, that can that can actually be both controlled and there's a lack of control um, in terms of uh, some of the aspects of of privacy that is given up um, in those contexts. So. Um, these are some aspects of what would be described as digital natives. And these are some features that are really crucial um, uh, for maintaining uh, freedom in an age of terrorism. And I think that um, uh, we see a balance. I think that there's a reaction often, and, and uh, at least I've, I've, I've heard some in, uh, uh, in, in the news this past, this past week, a reaction um, among traditionalists um, to, to view uh, crises such as these as occasions to close things down, um, to um, to close ranks, um, to engage in uh, in more secretive monitoring, um, and 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 work in in such ways. And I think that um, for youth. Um, 
I think there's a way to uh, offer security and offer safety that actually doesn't, um, it isn't based and isn't premised on uh, on a notion of, of things being closed and things being um, things being secret, um, but rather open, and that um, even security, even safety, uh, can be uh, most effective with. Um, uh, many eyes uh, on, on one situation, if the, the redundancy of, of uh, perspective uh, allows for there to be greater, um, greater uh, security. Uh, the transparency and the trust that's created um, enables there to be more um, uh, uh, depth of, uh, of investigation. Uh, there are different points of view um, that come to the table in order to solve problems. There's cooperation, um, which is invited rather than uh, solely in, in, in a small group of people. And as was repeated, a notion of bottom up, um, uh, the fact that, uh, that people can be vigilant. I think that the news um, that we, uh, that some of the most relevant news that came about uh, amongst uh, uh, that, that, that surfaced onto the news came from Twitter. Now, I don't know uh, how, how many of you use Twitter, but when I first saw it, it I, I, didn't, I didn't fully get it, I'll admit. Um, just sort of, I am um, a, a short announcement of what I'm doing at the moment. Um, didn't seem to, to uh, didn't seem to go so far or deep. But it turns out that in terms of spreading news of what's happening at the moment, um, that kind of uh, a sprawl um, of individuals uh, taking note, citizen journalism uh, on their own, uh, 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 reporting what's taking place in a way that's, uh, that's, that's networked immediately um, is something that, uh, that actually captured um, what was taking place uh, more effectively than, than the uh, uh, traditional professional organizations. So, um, digital natives, um, uh, as, as, as one description of what youth offer um, substantively, uh, is, is significant um, in order to maintain the themes that are really pushed here at IGF in terms of multi-stakeholderism and openness um, and access. And this is, this is something that um, in order to uh, preserve those notions and those values uh, in the next era of, of governance and as we lay down the infrastructure as it's, as it's still being built um, of our information world, um, it's crucial to bring uh, youth into the room, not just because it's nice to have them and to gain experience and to bring them into the room. It's because they know something that others don't. Um, they have a natural sense um, of how uh, these things can work together and how uh, collaborative development and transparency and bottom-up um, works and can be effective and can be innovative. And I think that we should, um, we should uh, make sure for the sake of those values uh, to include them. So um, just to, um, to close, I think that uh, um, the concepts that are not necessarily brought together um, but ought to be and come more naturally to digital natives, which I'd like to end with, is uh, openness and responsibility. Um, responsibility, accountability, um, and, and, and some of those notions um, are often uh, um, associated with a more closed process, a more um, uh, defined structure. And I think that uh, the, the digital natives and, and uh, youth generally are paving the way and showing the possibilities of how open infrastructures can actually provide uh, the kinds of um, uh, societal structures that we need. And so I urge the people here um, and also those who are making decisions um, as we go on to remember that um, that it isn't just um, it isn't just for the sake of inclusion but it's also um, from a real strategic thinking in terms of the long-term health of our online environment um, to include uh, more youth and their perspective thanks very much for your attention
Thank you, Don. I think if there's one theme to pick up on from the two presentations, it's um, this instinct young people have to connect and communicate op openly with peers, no matter the location, the cultural context, and so on. Um, there's also the flip side, which Don me mentioned, related to security and privacy, and we'll hear more about those issues in the second half of the of the session. But first, uh, we'll. Uh, uh, we'll have Naveen Tafik tell us a little bit about youth empowerment in Egypt. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. I'm so happy to be here uh, today um, in this uh, youth workshop. Um, I think that having a youth workshop during the IGF is not uh, a luxury, it's not uh, a possibility, it's a necessity. And I'm very happy that uh, several organizations had actually the idea of having this workshop. I would like to thank very much uh, Rose Ifed um, Gill, uh, uh, our moderator, who couldn't join us today, as well as Maya and the Diplo Foundation for allowing me actually to come and participate. Uh, my name is Naveen Taufi and I come from the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology in Egypt. I would like to share with you actually our experience with the work of youth in the field of internet governance as well as in the field of safety online in general. We have a small project, a modest project uh, called the Cyber Peace Initiative. Uh, the Cyber Peace Initiative actually Oh. I'm very sorry about this. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, the Cyber Peace Initiative actually is uh, a project that was launched in um, September 2007 between the Ministry of Communication, the Suzanne Mubarak Women International Peace Movement, the ITU, Mr. Touré, the UN Global Alliance for ICT and Development, as well as Microsoft, uh, Cisco, and Intel. And you have here a picture of all the partners uh, during the signing ceremony. The initiative itself is focusing on youth. The whole target of uh, the project is actually empowering youth uh, through the use of ICTs. Our belief is actually that youth is really the native speakers of uh, the ICT and that uh, without them actually uh, the whole sector uh, cannot go on and we're trying to build more on their capabilities. The Cyber Peace Initiative is composed of different tracks. Um, there is the empowerment part where we conduct very intensive training. Uh, we have also camps uh, focusing on the use of ICT. We have e-content development uh, based on user-generated content, uh, as well as EPs e contests. Uh, most importantly, uh, the Cyber Peace Initiative has the safety track, internet safety for young people. We felt that in order to empower people, in order to help them use ICT more constructively, it is very important to engage them also in the debate and in the work about how to use the internet in a safe way. And that's why we have uh, actually developed and formed related together with young people uh, the internet safety for young people track the internet safety for young people track is actually a, a a line of work that focuses on peer-to-peer -peer, uh, training. We have formed a young a group of people uh, uh, well versed in internet as well as safety issues and this has taken place uh, throughout the last year and we are hoping and we have actually started uh, to uh, refer to this group to engage in peer-to-peer -peer training about internet safety. Uh, the photos the, the presentation is not, uh, um, I don't know what is happening, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Not going back to the photos of the First Lady and Hamadoun Touré, I think. <laughs> you, you see here actually some of our training sessions, actual training sessions that took place in Cairo and a regional conference that we had about the use of uh, the, the internet uh, for young people. This was actually the young people, our group, the Net Amen group, that we have formed uh, taking part in the conference and in the sessions. Of course, Diplo was with us and other many other partners. Um, our work methodology, this is a graph representing how we have structured ourselves. We have uh, selected first the, the young people who are going to work on safety uh, during last year in 2007 and uh, in 2008. And we have drawn these young people from different NGOs working with us, as well as from the International Youth Network of the Suzanne Mubarak Movement and from the public, from universities and uh, from schools. We went through different stages, the selection, the formation and the 
production. And in this stage, we have actually referred to international consultants because we believe that we cannot really start from scratch. ChildNet International was very helpful uh, in forming the group and in giving us an interesting vision about how the group should be working. We went then through tr specialized training sessions, uh, not only thematic uh, sessions, but also soft skills to help the students, to help the young people actually uh, uh, develop uh, the communication skills that are necessary to uh, talk about the awareness message of uh, internet safety. Uh, in addition to that, we have started actually a dialogue between these young people and different stakeholders in society, um, ISPs, governorates, schools, parents, teens, and I'll go through that uh, in a minute. Uh, in our work methodology, we went, as I said, we went through different stages, but the most important stage was actually the capacity building stage. This was very challenging because we couldn't focus only on the internet skills or the ICT skills. We had to focus on different other skills that are necessary for young people to be able to speak to a larger audience or to the public. The motivation part was also very important. Uh, these young people are students, so we had to give them different kinds of compensations, uh, whether recognition or some financial rewards to make them uh, motivated all the time to go on. Interestingly, the field work in itself, getting the young people in the field work, was a very strong motivation for them. They loved it. And uh, they were very interested in going to schools and talking to telecenters. Uh, this is a slide about some of our training sessions. This was a soft skill session, and this is actually uh, our young people in schools. Um, another two points that were very important in our work methodology was the self-governance of the group, the net MN group, uh, the, the, the internet safety group, and the division of labor. Again, the group was very, uh, it was very important for the group to feel that they are self-governed. Uh, so we also helped them to choose their leader and co-leader. We developed a system by which they change the leadership every six months or uh, every year according to their uh, willingness. And also we spent more time with the leader and co-leader uh, to develop their skills of leadership. Another important uh, principle was the division of labor. Uh, it was also very important for them to feel motivated uh, by giving them act real tasks. So we had uh, actually selected coordinators for schools, we selected coordinators for telecenters, we selected coordinators for the Arabization and localization of material. Once we selected the coordination, it was easier to work because the young people felt really responsible. The sense of responsibility was uh, developed. Um, another principle also we worked on was the engagement and communication, and this we did through camps. We hosted uh, the young people in different uh, events. Uh, this is a picture from the ITU Africa Telecom. Uh, before ITU Africa Telecom, we had a separate camp for the Net Amen group, the safety group, the Egyptian safety group, where we gave them more skills, where they actually spent three days together, and then they joined ITU Africa Telecom. So it was a very intensive training for them, and it was also a way to put them in the right context um, to help them also engage in the international uh, dialogue. Our initiative wouldn't have been possible without the collaboration with partners. And we're very lucky to have very active partners. Uh, as I mentioned before, the founder is the Suzanne Mubarak movement. The Ministry of Communication is giving a very strong support. Um, uh, the Global Alliance, the ITU, uh, Microsoft is providing us with the toolkit, the material for the safety. Uh, Intel, Huawei, ChildNet International was providing us with the expertise to form the group. The World Summit Award is working with us now, and we have worked also with the Global Knowledge Partnership. We hope to be able to uh, add to our list of partners uh, during the IGF and to explore other fields of uh, cooperation. Um, these are examples from our peer-to-peer -peer training. You can see here. Um, to your right, actually. Uh, these are the mobile units. We have in Egypt mobile units that move actually from one governorate to the other. This is a picture taken from Luxor. Uh, 
And our young people, some of uh, our net MN group, move with these mobile units to raise awareness in the different governorates. This is a very exciting experience as well. This picture is taken from actual training in schools, in public schools. And this is our young people teaching actually um, through some games uh, how the World Wide Web looks like for uh, school students. Some more pictures from schools and um, our peer-to-peer -peer training. This is an inside picture from the mobile unit. Okay. Um, give, uh, please allow me to give you an idea about some of our young energetic people who are members of the Net Amen. For instance, Ahmed, Ahmed Ragab. Ahmed Ragab is the coordinator of the safety track with telecenters, and he is doing, I think, a great job. This is a picture from our uh, um, awareness workshop with telecenters, IT clubs in Cairo. Um, this is the picture of Yasmin. Yasmin is the leader of NetMN now. And this is a picture of Nadaradi, who's actually engaged in the Arabization and localization of material. And this is some of the material that we have actually produced in Arabic with the help of ChildNet International. Um, just very few pic pictures about uh, our young people uh, going, attending regional and international conferences to engage in the debate about internet governance and safety. Pictures from a UK conference, the International Youth Advisory Congress, from the JKP in Kuala Lumpur in 2007, and from the ITU Africa uh, Telecom. These are pictures actually from our um, group, real pictures of our, our young people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Naveen. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you in the audience for the patience as we solve some of the technical uh, challenges. Let's uh, hear from, from, let's turn it over to the audience for a, uh, a couple of questions. And uh, I apologize on behalf of one of our speakers, Idan has had to run over to another panel. So he isn't here, but I'll be happy to note down any questions you have for him and forward them to him. But if you have questions for um, Marilia and Naveen, um, now's I think a great opportunity to pose them. Do we have some microphones? 